As we come to this last lecture in our little series here, the third one on heaven, we face this heavy question with which we closed the last uh, lecture about heavens contemplating not only this world, but actually hell itself and rejoicing in it. There can't be any question about that, can there? If it's heaven, there's joy. And if they know about hell, there has to be joy about hell, as well as about what God is doing in this world and such things as that. There's no escaping it, it seems to me. This, in other words, though Edwards addresses this question in the point we're taking up now, this is not something which he invented or a problem which only he was sensitive faces every one of us, and each one of us must find a satisfactory answer to it. Number one, therefore, an objection arises. If saints are to grieve now, lest men go to hell, how can they rejoice when they do? That's my way of putting the question, but uh, it's the same question that Edwards is addressing in the answers I'm about to, about to listen. We are commanded to pray for our enemies and for those who despitefully use us. They would to God, we did go to H E W L. We, on the other hand, are praying that they will not go there. We want to do everything in our power to save them from it, even to the point of asking God for it, praying that they not go to hell, and then they go to hell and we're to rejoice in it. How can that be? Was the question. Edwards gives five answers in one of his sermons to this particular point. First of all, it is a Christian's duty now to love even the wicked, not knowing, but that they may be loved of God. In hell they are seen to be hated of God, and so are hated by the saints. See, he's adding really two points there. He's saying that we are commanded by Scripture to love our enemies, and these enemies are described as persons who are hellish people because they aren't legitimate enemies. These are enemies who say all manner of evil against you falsely, use you despitefully. These aren't difference between Democrats and Republicans and so on. These are people who are enemies to God as well as to you, and they're enemies to you because you're living righteously, and they're saying all manner of evil against you falsely. You are commanded to, reward, to rejoice and be exceeding glad in that situation there. But uh, Edwards adds in addition to that fact that you are commanded to pray for people no matter how, how hellish their behavior may be, no matter how depraved their relationship to you may be, you don't approve of such behavior, but at the same time that you may even rebuke it, you love the person, you do good to him, and you pray for his being rescued from the perdition, which is certainly to follow if he does not repent of his ways. And I may say, you can tell him that sort of thing without being unloving. As a matter of fact, the loving thing may be to do that. Don't you know that when you actually say these things slanderously and scandalously about me, you're only adding stars to my crown, but you're adding and heaping up wrath against your own judgment. I appreciate what you're doing for me, <laughs> but I hate what you're doing for yourself. You know, I, uh, I'm talking about it uh, hypothetically, but when Justin Martyr, for example, so-called because he was an early church martyr, when the Romans were going to put him to death as a Christian, he begged them for their sakes not to do it. He almost begged them for his sake, please put that sword through me. He was honored. He knew it was a great privilege to die for Jesus Christ, but he honestly begged them for their own sakes. And so we would do the same thing with respect to these uh, persons. Uh, but Edwards also adds this point that we don't know that they may not be the chosen of God. They're unregenerate at the moment. They're behaving hellishly. If they continue the way they are, they certainly will be damned. But you don't know. They may have been chosen. They may be beloved of God, and they may be the beneficiaries of the Atonement. And in time, they may be brought savingly to Him. He doesn't mention it here, but in, uh, he preached quite a good deal. He didn't preach so much on it. 
Uh, but he wrote a good deal as miscellanies about the unpardonable sin. And he often warned people who were opposing the great awakening which was taking place in New England in those days that they were precariously close to the unpardonable uh, sin. But where a person actually commits the unpardonable sin, and you know it, then you know full well you're not to pray for that person, and you don't love him. Why? Because the unpardonable sin is an indication that there will be no forgiveness for that person. You know that. Now, he's the same as in hell. No matter what you do, it will not benefit that person. Now, you don't know that about any other human being except someone who is committed. The other person who's slanderously be uh, hating himself toward you and doing all sorts of hellish things toward you may nevertheless be an elect of God, chosen of God, destined to everlasting life. And you don't know that that may not be the case. That's another reason, incidentally, but fundamentally the commandment is to love your enemy. Love your enemies, even though those enemies are the enemies of God who are hellish creatures on their way to hell if they are not converted. Second, that's the first reason, you see. You're, you're to pray for them because uh, they, uh, uh, you don't know that uh, God doesn't love them. They, you are to behave differently if you knew that God didn't, as is the case in hell. I gave the illustration that Edwards doesn't give here. It's true even in this world where you know someone has committed the unpardonable sin, you see. But that, that person you don't even pray for. You can't love him. He's rejected of God. But you see, in hell, you know everybody in hell is such. You're aware of that. Being there is a definition of being rejected by God. But in this world, no matter how hellishly a person may be, even though he may be murdering Christians, as Saul of Tarsus was and so on, he may be beloved of God who will ultimately be saved. And that's part of the reason you are commanded to love your enemies. Second, all men are now capable, so far as we know at least, of salvation through the efforts of men, but in hell salvation is past forever. Right now it's your job to try to disciple the nations, to win everybody, to become all things to all men that you might by all means win some. That is actually uh, your duty. But in hell, salvation is past. You have no such obligation as that at all. The greatest love you could ever show anybody is to try to win that person to Jesus Christ. That's what you should be doing with everybody whom you have any reasonable or suitable opportunity to do, but you don't do that for people in hell. They are beyond redemption. So the situation, if you remember, we're wrestling with a problem. How can you be commanded to love and do good to people who, when they go to hell, you rejoice in their damnation? You try to save them from damnation, but when they go to damnation, you're happy about it. How can that be? Well, Edwards is pointing out the reason you do it is God commands you, and the reason he does it is they may be beloved, and you know there's a possibility as far as you or the other person, unless that person commit the unpardonable sin if it's being saved. But in hell, the situation is entirely different. No such possibility as that exists. So your relationship to the person can quite understandably change, and it wouldn't be so uh, seemingly opposite and paradoxical as on the surface it might appear to be. Third, rejoice. Here's a subtle point that shows Edwards as the ethicist that he is, though it's not in an ethical treatise. Rejoicing at calamities now may be because of envy, vengeance, and other evil disposition, but in heaven saints rejoice only in the glory of God. It's wrong to rejoice here, and it's wrong not to rejoice there. I may say in this connection, I don't know that Edwards ever treats it in this connection, but uh, let me add this particular point. You know how Ezekiel says to us that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Here the saints in heaven are having pleasure in the death of the wicked. And God doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. What would be the explanation of that? Well, I think the explanation in both cases is the same. What is meant with reference to God is also meant with reference to the saints. God sends people to hell. Hell is His presence in anger, as we've said. 
and yet he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's as much as to say he has pleasure in hell, he has no pleasure in hell. Well, the answer, I would say, is this. So, uh, theologians, I know some very good theologians who cop out on this one. There's some of them do worse and give a, what I think is an unsatisfactory answer. But I think the explanation is this. We know God's pleasure stands firm. His counsel it is fixed. He knows all things from the beginning. He has decreed hell. Hell burns forever because God has determined it and only because God has determined it. He has pleasure in all His works. He has pleasure in heaven and He has pleasure in hell. Now, what is the meaning of this, His own statement? He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Well, what it must mean, it seems to me, is this. He doesn't get any pleasure in tormenting people. He's not a cosmic sadist of some sort. What he gets pleasure in is manifesting his holiness, his justice, his righteousness, his power, his wrath. The whole purpose of the existence of anything is the manifestation of the glory of God. Now, he gets no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Death as such is no pleasure to him. It's death as the punishment deserved that's a pleasure to him. Now, what Edwards is saying in this particular context, apropos our problem, is that in this life, because of total sin in the unregenerate and a great deal of remaining sin in the regenerate, we can actually, out of a spirit of envy and vengeance, which doesn't belong to us, but to God, have pleasure in the death of the wicked. And that's a sin. We are not to have it. In hell, it's a different story. In hell, we see that everybody, no matter how indescribably horrible a suffering may be, we recognize it's deserved. Every iota of it is deserved. Anything more would be a sin. Anything less would be a sin. This is precisely what ought to happen to them. And we have to know that now. Edwards, at one particular point, says, probably if we could see hell, we would die at the mere sight of it. Probably so. We certainly are not in a state of grace now where we can actually see it and understand it in its horror. As I said a moment ago, the mere contemplation of it, the mere realization of the verity of it, is enough to shake us to the foundations. But you see, there in heaven, we will see it as what it really is, what people deserve. Even now we know that when somebody commits a criminal act and is not punished for what he deserved, he's in his right mind, he knew what he was doing, it was with malice and a forethought and so on, and he's not punished, we suffer from that. And when he's punished properly, when the punishment fits the crime, when it's not excessive or a slap on the wrist, but the real thing, there's a deep satisfaction in every one of us. We know it's wrong for wickedness not to be punished. And in hell, we know now, and we'll know even better then, not because we see it more clearly, but because we will be more spiritually attuned to the rightness of it, that it's exactly what ought to happen. And that's going to send us singing. That's what Edwards is saying there, I think, though I've added a few things that he didn't actually mention. The fourth point he mentions is this. Natural affection is no virtue in the saints in glory. Their virtue will exercise itself in a higher manner. See, here it's a duty to love your parents, to do good. You see, but there where relationships don't exist, they're neither married nor given in marriage, and even though here you might have a despicable parent whom you nevertheless respect as a parent, 
and you do as good to that person as that parent may have done evil to you, and so on, because it is your father, it is your mother, it is your brother, it is your sister, and such things as that. That is a divinely instituted relationship in this world, and it has certain duties connected with it. And it would be a very, very ruthless thing for you to rejoice in the damnation of your father or mother or sister or a brother because of the relationship. But that won't obtain in another world. You have no obligation to someone because it's your husband or your wife or your brother or your sister or anything else. You have your relationship based on spiritual verity. Heaven is a place where, I haven't mentioned this before, but I think you can read uh, between the lines. Heaven is a place where everybody receives exactly what he deserves, and hell is a place where everybody receives exactly what he deserves. And I can see the machinery going in on your mind there. I can understand, Gerstner, why you didn't say that before about heaven being a place where people receive what they deserve, because you must know as an evangelical that's an absolute travesty. We're saved by grace. We don't deserve anything at all. Oh, no. You deserve all the blessing you receive in heaven because God has purchased it for you. It's been paid for in full by Jesus Christ. God, and this is something which is in Edwards, too, God would not be a just and a holy God if you are in Christ Jesus and are not rewarded, given, eternal life. He owes it to you now. You can stand on your rights and say, God, you can't cast me out. You have bought me with the price of your son. I am accepted in him. You wouldn't talk that way, but you could talk that way if he were ever to challenge your right, but which he would never do, and so on. But you, he is a God of infinite justice. And while you're in heaven by grace, it's a grace which has satisfied justice completely, and you are entitled to it thoroughly, not because of anything you did, but because of everything he did, but he did it for you. You were nailed to the cross with him. You were buried with him. You were raised with him. You were justified by him. This is yours now by his merit, not yours. But you see, that's the way a holy and a just God does proceed according to strict righteousness. And you will recognize that just as truly as you have in heaven what Christ has earned for you, they will have in hell what they have earned for themselves. And you will be rejoicing in the perfect blessedness of the saints, and you will be rejoicing in the perfect misery of the sinners. Heaven will actually be singing because of hell. As I say, when we first meet the concept, and I've seen theologians turn inside out by it, I couldn't possibly rejoice. The misery of the end would make a hell out of heaven just to see people, some dear friend of mine, suffering forever. How in the world could I be happy? All of a sudden, God, who is love, loves everybody. He's got to be the most miserable being in all the universe, and how could heaven be a place of rejoicing where God is everlastingly weeping? Utterly impossible that such a possibility as that could exist. And the only way it couldn't exist is because absolute justice prevails all around the line, and you will see. You see it now, theoretically or you're not a Christian, I'll be, I'll be strong with you at this point. If you can't now rejoice in hell, I think you have every reason to ask whether you're converted or not. It's that serious. And one thing is certain, you're not prepared for heaven, because as soon as you go there, you will see hell in all its unspeakable terror, and you will be singing hallelujahs to God for it. But the reason will be not immorality, not sadism, not cruelty, but love and justice and purity and rejoicing in the excellencies of God. So what looks at first as an awesome problem is, a matter of fact, a marvelous means of grace. 
The last point he mentions here is fifth, when God takes vengeance on oppressors, it is always because of his love to his saints. So in hell, this infinite love for his own will be eternally visible in the punishment of their wicked enemies whom they may have loved in the world. See, that's the ultimate turning of the screw. There wouldn't be a hell if it weren't for you. The only reason it exists is to give joy to heaven by the revelation of God's full character as a holy, just, powerful, sovereign God. Number three, that the eternity of the future state of happiness or misery spoken of in Scripture is a proper eternity, absolutely excluding any end, is most clearly manifest in Luke 20, 36 and other uh, places. It talks about the death of, no more death in heaven and so on. It reminds you of John Owen's famous statement, the death of death. Now, on the other hand, see, there's nothing but death and hell and there'd be no death at all in heaven. Here's a, in one of his sermons, Edwards wrestles with that question, how can there be eternal death? How can a person be absolutely crushed under God and still alive? And so on. It's hard for us to follow him. It's hard for us to follow any, anybody in reasoning on this, but nevertheless, they go away into eternal punishment. This is eternal death, according to Thessalonians, and so on. What can there be an eternal death? See? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's beyond me. But as I say, Edwards will turn himself inside out trying to get that over. One thing you've got to do is live with it. There's a kind of extinction of the human being which goes on forever. Not annihilation, ten arguments to the contrary and so on. Not annihilation, but a state like death. Yeah, I remember in one of his analyses, he talks about a, well, this isn't centered in the hands of an angry God, but about a, 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 a uh, spider or some animal or worm being dropped into a fire, putting up a fight against the flames at first, and then being overcome and just shriveling up. He sort of describes something like that in a human being, trying at first as he falls under the wrath of God and into that fiery furnace and so on, resisting at first and then giving up and existing as it were as if he weren't existing. It had to be something like that, to be death and yet eternal life, death in misery here. But it has to be eternal, no way around it, and the same thing he says with respect to heaven. This, uh, he points out, as is often pointed out by others, the word ionios and so on means eternal. And whether God's talking about eternal death or eternal life, it's the same. It's forever and uh, forever, and for those in heaven, of course, that's the greatest joy about it. Any other pleasure we know in this world, for example, it has a terminus. We know it's going to be over. I know when I was a useful member of the cloth and pastor and had uh, August is our vacation. We'd start planning September 1st for our next vacation. And then when August the 1st came around, we had all the maps in the car and the wheels started to roll. Very first day of vacation, I began to get miserable because I had one less day of vacation and two less days of vacation. That's the way it is with all these particular pleasures. We know they're going to end, whereas heaven, you know, it'll never end. It's indescribably wonderful and it's going to be forever and ever. On the other hand, hell, Never going to end. You can stand any kind of misery, but you know full well it's going to be over sometime, at least by death. But here's a death which is forever. But you see, it's throughout this study of heaven and hell, this parallelism, the perfect misery, the perfect blessedness, and just exactly according to reason and according to corresponding uh, conditions uh, analogous to one another. Number four, many more texts are cited to prove the same point with the main emphasis on the eternality of heaven proven by the last enemy death being conquered. Number five, not only is heaven eternal, but also the heavenly inhabitants do, as it were, remain in eternal youth. They're growing all the time, but they're not growing older. I see some of you people who are half my age smiling at that and so on, so you can imagine somebody like me uh, here. But that, we all know that witticism of Bernard Shaw, youth is such a wonderful thing, it's a shame to waste it on young people. Now, here, here's a youth which won't be wasted on young people. I mean, the young people won't be, uh, they won't be youthful. The young people won't be stupid, wasting all that virility and life and power that they have. They'll be, 
Here they will be as young as they can be, young be, and yet they'll be as wise as the aged could be. That's the kind of situation in heaven. You're everlastingly growing, wiser, better, and holier, and so on, and at the same time, not growing at all, not growing older, but remaining in perpetual uh, youth. Number six, glorious as is the fellowship of the saints with Christ and other saints and angels, the peak of heavenly blessedness is the sight of God Himself, the amor intellectualis dei. He goes into quite a discussion of that particular point. You see, God is ultimately a spirit. And he takes a, uh, down here a little further. He talks about the beatifical vision without reading the material there. Uh, let me just explain what the ultimate blessing of heaven is in the opinion of most all theologians, not just Jonathan Edwards. This is standard, but uh, blessed as is the communion with one another, blessed is the fellowship with the angels, blessed is the beholding of hell, blessed is the seeing of the death of a saint in this world and coming to heaven, the conversion of an individual, blessed as all of that may be, blessed as is the seeing of the resurrected Christ in His glorified humanity. He'll be the center of heaven as far as visibility is concerned. The transcendent, supreme blessing of heaven is actually when the pure in heart see God. No man has seen God at any time visibly. He has never appeared except in the person of the second member of the Trinity who became incarnate and appeared before. But the beatific vision properly speaking, is the beholding, as far as the creature is able to behold, the very spirituality of God. God as God, God qua God, is actually seen in certain moments, uh, Edwards would think, and I think Aquinas the same way, not always, but it'd be a sort of special peak of glory in heaven when the saints actually are able with the spirit's eyes, uh, with the mind's eye, with the suitcase mind, not with a soma ever, uh, see God. I point out here in closing that uh, Edwards does uh, insist that this can't be through the senses, and he won't even allow it through the instrumentality of the senses. See, it's an interesting thing here. Uh, Edwards is a great idealist, and in his analysis of being, it's usually in terms of idea and so on, and the body. He had a rather feeble body himself. His mind was gigantic, but his body was not very strong, and so on. But uh, he always saw the body as something of a, a drag, something of a, an impediment that hampered true understanding, and so on. And even while he, of course, uh, uh, enthusiastically endorses the notion of the resurrection of the body and the perfection of the body, fitted for an eternal existence, and so on, he still will not have it in any way involved in the beatific vision. See, normally you'd think since we would be in heaven, we would be incarnated in this perfect body, fitted to our perfect soul for a perfect and eternal existence, that uh, the knowing process would go on somewhat the way it is now, through the body, to the mind, and so on, even to the beatific vision. But not for Edwards. The mind, the body can't have anything to do with it. This is a direct vision of soul with soul, mind with mind, spirit with spirit, redeemed creature with God as God. Since my time is uh, nearly up here, let me read number nine, and uh, that I hope you've got written at the bottom, number 10, a new number 10. Hence the grand conclusion, tis not in beholding any form of visible representation or shape or color or shining light that the highest happiness of the soul consists in, but tis in seeing God who is a spirit spiritually with the eyes of the soul. The saints in heaven shall see God. The pure in heart shall see God. You have written at the very bottom there. I don't know whether I got a chance to change this, but uh, I'm going to insert this last thing as I conclude the little series here. Nevertheless, the worst place in the universe is not hell, nor the best place, heaven, but this world for every one of you. And this is definitely John Gerstner, not Jonathan Edwards. I'm not even sure he would agree uh, with this, but I think you know what I mean. He should agree with it. I mean, his old theology uh, would call for it, 
but I've never heard him state it this way, and I'm not as sure that he would accept my statement of it this way. But what I mean is this, my dear friends, if you are not in Christ now, every moment you live, you're making hell more terrible. You're adding up wrath against the day of wrath, as Paul says in Romans 2. It would be better for you if somebody carried you out of here tonight. You're actually, it would be better for you to be in hell now, because every moment you remain out of hell impenitent, hell is going to be the more terrible through eternity. But by the same token, where you are now is better than being in heaven because every cup of cold water you give in His name is going to enrich heaven eternally for you. You are able to lay up more treasures in heaven because you are here on earth. Shall we pray? Lord God, we thank Thee that Thou hast revealed to us these two places more important than the world in which we are now, hell and heaven, and also the verity that where we are now, we may make hell more terrible, but we may also lay up treasures forevermore. Bless us all, we pray Thee, that in Christ we may be delivered from hell and live with Him and the redeemed of the Lord forever in Thy precious presence in heaven. In Christ's name, amen.